Hi, everyone. I'm Diane Powell, Chair and CEO of the Hypersomnia Foundation, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our first virtual event, The Research Continues. Over the next 90 minutes, we'll be talking about ongoing research into hypersomnia causes and treatments. Despite the pandemic and the economic downturn of 2020, researchers are still researching, volunteers are still signing up for clinical trials, and treatments are moving towards FDA approval. Today, I'd like to introduce you to a few of the people who are working to improve the lives of those with IH and related sleep disorders. I'd like to start by thanking our sponsors, Harmony Biosciences, Jazz Pharmaceuticals, and Takeda Pharmaceutical Company. Their support helps make this program possible and allows us to offer it as a free event. So here's a quick rundown of our schedule. Our first two presenters are recipients of funding from our research award program, which is made possible by your donations, Dr. Carolyn Mayness and Dr. Todd Bishop. After that, we'll take a short break and share a few announcements. Then we'll hear from Christina Brundage, a volunteer whose passion for finding new treatments for IH has led her to sign up for several clinical trials. And finally, we have Dr. Marisa Whalen of Jazz Pharmaceuticals. Recently, Jazz's treatment for idiopathic hypersomnia, Zywave, received fast track status from the FDA. And now it's time to turn the program over to my co-host and fellow board member, Rebecca King. Rebecca? Thank you, Diane. My name is Rebecca King, and I have the honor of introducing all four of our speakers today. I will also be moderating the Q&A. So it's time to introduce our first speaker. Dr. Caroline Manis's interest in the brain began really early. She earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Neuroscience and Behavioral Biology from Emory University in 2011. In between college and middle school, school, she was a science teacher at Benjamin E. Hayes High School in Atlanta, where she taught biology, microbiology, human anatomy, forensic science, and genetics. She was then a cum laude graduate of Emory School of Medicine in 2017, is now a fourth year neurology resident and serves as the chief resident for Emory Neurology. So in between residency rounds and her many chief resident responsibilities, she somehow finds time to conduct research on sleep disorders. Her proposal to study cytokine profiles in the central disorders of hypersomnolence was the first winner of the hyper. Somnia Foundation's Research Award. So let's welcome Caroline. We're going to be showing her presentation in a recorded uh, format first, and then she will be coming on the screen live to answer the questions. So please enjoy the presentation. Hey, my name is Caroline Manis. I'm a PGY4 resident of the Emory Department of Neurology. I was the first recipient of the Hypersomnia Foundation Research Award. And it's my honor to present to you my findings today on cytokine profiles and disorders of hypersomnolence. So let's get started. The Hypersomnia Foundation Research Award funded this project in its entirety, and I have no other financial disclosures. So starting with the roadmap as to where we're going, I'm gonna start by introducing what cytokines are and the role they play in your body and in inflammation. I will then move on to a description of my study and the results of my study, followed by the implications of my findings and the next steps. Some jargon and abbreviations. I'll use the term statistical significance a few times. And this helps us quantify in research studies whether a difference that we see is real or occurred by chance. So for example, if we are testing two medications and medication A is reported to work better than medication B, is this really happening or is this just occurring by chance? Um, IH and NT2 will be used to abbreviate some of our um, diagnoses. And then anytime you see the um, abbreviation EDS, I will use this to describe a group of patients that report significant sleepiness, but when you study them in the sleep lab, they do not fit a diagnosis of narcolepsy or idiopathic hypersomnia. So what are cytokines anyway? Cytokines are a group of proteins that act in your immune response. They're not antibodies per se. Um, but they respond in, uh, to viral or bacterial infections that may be in your body. And they can either be pro-inflammatory, meaning that they augment or upregulate the infl inflammatory response, or they can be anti-inflammatory, meaning they kind of taper down the inflammatory response. 
And cytokines have been known for decades to play a role in rheumatological diseases, um, for example, in rheumatoid arthritis. So since the 1990s, there have been medications available to suppress cytokines in the body, used commonly in rheumatoid arthritis, as well as things like psoriatic arthritis. Um, the first uh, cytokine inhibitors were TNF-alpha inhibitors, but there are now other cytokine inhibitors as well. You may have heard of these on the news recently, as COVID-19 has a lot to do with an inflammatory response, and some of these medications have been used to fight the inflammatory response in COVID-19. So as far as cytokines and sleep, for about the past 15 years, there's been more research into the role of cytokines in sleep. And cytokines actually appear to be the cause of sleepiness and in acute infection. So if you test the blood of someone who's acutely affected with a virus or a bacteria, they'll have elevated levels of TNF-alpha. And conversely, if you give TNF-alpha to someone who is healthy, they will begin to feel fatigued and sleepy as if they were sick. Additionally, sleep deprivation can increase your level of IL-6. I'll talk about that more in a minute. And then prior studies have shown that there are elevations in both TNF-alpha and IL-6 in obstructive sleep apnea, as well as in narcolepsy. Those are both pro-inflammatory cytokines. And I'll talk about those a little bit more in just a moment. So regarding the circadian role with our cytokines, this is a graph that shows healthy controls and levels of their IL-6 throughout the day and how it may play a role in triggering sleepiness. This study here helps illustrate two concepts. Number one is that some of the cytokines, IL-6 in particular, aren't secreted at a steady rate throughout the day. They're actually circadian and kind of rise and fall throughout a 24-hour period. And the other thing that this study illustrates is the change in those um, troughs and peaks based on sleep deprivation. So on the left here, this is a chart showing the levels of IL-6 throughout the day in a group of eight healthy control males. As you can see, there are two troughs and there are two peaks, with the larger peak being here around 4 a.m. So these individuals are asleep for this peak. Now, the chart to the right shows these individuals after a night of sleep deprivation. And what you can see is that the troughs are actually about the same. But what changes are actually the peak levels, and that larger peak, as opposed to being around 4 a.m., now occurs around 8 p.m. to have a very high level of um, IL-6 at this time. And what this could account for is that feeling of yuckiness, fatigue, and lethargy that you may feel after a night of sleep deprivation, given that you're awake for the surge in IL-6 that usually you're, you're asleep during. So moving on to prior research of cytokines and sleep disorders, this prior study looked at obstructive uh, sleep apnea, narcolepsy, and then idiopathic hypersomnia, but this is not IH as we think of it now. These were patients that simply did not meet criteria for narcolepsy, but were sleepy. And in this study, we saw that IL-6 and TNF-alpha, both inflammatory cytokines, were elevated in narcolepsy patients and patients with obstructive sleep apnea. There was not a significant difference in the IH patients as defined in this study, um, in their levels of these pro-inflammatory cytokines, which is one reason why I wanted to do the study that I'll be talking to you about today. So as far as the study design, it was a convenient sample of patients all evaluated at Emory Sleep Center. And looking at the cohort in its entirety, all the diagnosis can be shown there below. As far as the resources we had at our disposal, each patient had an overnight sleep study to help us define their diagnosis. We also had survey data available for each patient that rated their sleepiness, fatigue, and their sleep inertia, which is the difficulty actually truly waking up when you awaken in the morning. And then we had cytokine levels. There were 10 cytokines tested in total from blood samples from each patient. And then the concentration of these cytokines were reported in picograms per milliliter, which is a very small unit of measure. So as far as the results, 111 in patients who are included in the portion I will speak about today, 22 controls, 51 with IH, 26 with excessive sleepiness, and 12 with narcolepsy type 2. Now, as far as the data I'm going to present to you in context, a couple of factors can affect cytokine levels that have been known even without sleepiness, and those are age, body mass index, and gender. Interestingly, though, these factors did not consistently affect the cytokine levels across our different diagnostic groups, which makes you wonder if the diagnosis plays more of a role in affecting these levels than age, BMI, and gender happen to in our cohort. As far as age and cytokine levels, 
In controls and IH, age do not correlate with any cytokine. However, in EDS and narcolepsy type 2, age was negatively correlated with TNF-alpha, meaning as the patient's age went up, the level of TNF-alpha went down, which makes you wonder that if TNF-alpha is contributing to some of the symptoms in higher levels, perhaps the symptoms of these diseases potentially could improve with age as the levels do go down. BMI was also significantly correlated with several cytokines and several of our diagnostic groups, but for brevity's sake, I will not go in depth into those now. Now looking at cytokine levels stratified by diagnosis and gender, this graph here shows females in, um, excuse me, red, and then males here in blue. And there was a significant difference in the males with EDS and their level of TNF-alpha compared to the control males which makes you wonder if this increased level of TNF-alpha is contributing to their sleepiness. In the graph to the right, shows concentration of IL-10, an anti-inflammatory cytokine, also stratified by gender and diagnosis. What's interesting here is that you see high levels, once again, in the males with EDS, of this anti-inflammatory cytokine, which you wouldn't expect since they do have significant sleepiness, but what it makes you wonder is whether or not these two are connected and that this group of patients is simply in a higher inflammatory state than the other groups, and that could be contributing to their symptoms. Moving on to granulocyte colony stimulating factor in diagnosis, this is actually an anti-inflammatory cytokine. It helps tamper down the immune response. And you see relatively higher levels here in the controls compared to some of our diagnostic groups here. So some of these lower levels in our, for example, EDS group here, our narcolepsy type 2 group, may actually be contributing to some symptoms that you'll see in just a moment. Once again, this is granulocyte colony stimulating factor, and then on the x-axis here is weighted depression score, and this is in controls. So what you can see is there does not appear to be a relationship here between the level of GCSF and the level of rated depression. And then you can contrast this to the level of rated depression in patients with sleepiness disorders. And as you can see, as the rated level of depression goes up, the level of GCSF goes down. Similarly, the same phenomenon can be seen with sleep inertia. As patients with sleep inertia scores go up, the level of GCSF goes down, which makes you wonder, what's at play that's making these patients have lower levels of GCSF that could be contributing to symptoms? If we take a step back and look at the controls once again, what you can see is that as their hours slept per week goes up, their levels of GCSF go up. So sleeping more accrues more GCSF, which could potentially be protective to them against the symptoms I just mentioned. However, in contrast, if you look at the patients with sleep disorders, as their hours of sleep go up in a week, their levels of GCSF actually stay the same. So potentially part of the problem in sleep disorders is that these patients are unable to accrue more GCSF despite sleeping more, and thus are susceptible to these symptoms like depression, or sleep inertia that you can see with lower levels of GCSF. So what does this all mean? From these studies, we can look at a couple of different things. In science, we talk about lumping ideas and splitting ideas. So in terms of this study, some of our results are more apt to be lumped. If we lump all of the sleepy patients together and take into account their symptoms like depression and sleep inertia, and that in context with the lower GCSF, we potentially found a therapy um, target that we could use to decrease those symptoms by augmenting their level of GCSF. There could also be some examples of being able to split diagnoses from these results as well. From the graphs I showed you with the diagnoses stratified by gender, you could see that the levels of cytokines varied across each diagnosis and across each gender. And potentially what we could do is create profiles from these levels to help us assign patients diagnoses when we're currently uncertain about what their diagnosis should be. So what are the next steps in this study? My first next step will be to create a cluster analysis, which will help us to find better diagnostic criteria for some of these sleepy patients. What we can do is look at the cytokine profiles and then retrospectively look at which of those profiles fit together and create diagnosis from that. 
and then we can compare diagnoses that come from similar cytokine profiles to the current diagnoses we have and see if they're the same or different. Additionally, as I showed you from the prior study, cytokines can fluctuate throughout the day. So there may be utility in repeating a similar study, but taking multiple samples of cytokines throughout the day and seeing how the levels fluctuate. And then lastly, there have been studies in the past that successfully used TNF-alpha blockers in patients with OSA and sleepiness despite treatment, and this therapy actually did help decrease their symptoms. So what I wonder if we could use similar therapies to decrease symptoms in our patients with IH, narcolepsy, and EDS. I thank you so much for your time. Here are my references. I'd like to acknowledge a few folks. Number one, the Hypersomnia Foundation for allowing me to speak today and their generous grant my mentor, Lynn Marie Trotti, and Dr. Rye, as well as some of the other staff and nurse practitioners at the Sleep Center. Thank you so much and have a great afternoon. We do have some questions. Let's just get started. I'd like to start with one from a person who uh, is actually going through cytokine testing right now. She has idiopathic hypersomnia, but she's also been giving some other diagnoses that appear to have something to do with inflammation. And so the, some of the tests are happening. I think you mentioned 10 different cytokines that you were monitoring in this research. And there's a question about um, which cytokines do you think would be appropriate for somebody who would be going through testing, especially if they already have IH. So could, and then maybe even speak to the idea that could inflammation kind of first show up as IH and then manifest itself in some other symptoms or maybe vice versa. So just the link between all these cytokines and everything that might be going on with someone with IH, but some other uh, disorders as well. Of course, of course. So um, the cytokines that I looked at in this study were 10 in total, and those were IL-6, TNF-alpha, the granulocyte colony stimulating factor that I spoke about, and then several others, so IL-4, IL-1B, MCP-1, IL-8, IL-10, IL-2, and then interferon gamma. Um, some of these are what we call pro-inflammatory cytokines, meaning if their levels are higher in the body, um, you tend to have more inflammation. And then other ones are anti-inflammatory, meaning that their higher presence tries to kind of down-regulate your body's inflammatory response. Um, so the ones that we've looked at the most in the past with sleep disorders are IL-6 and TNF-alpha. Um, that was the study that I showed briefly at the beginning of my talk. Um, and those we know are elevated in narcolepsy type two and obstructive sleep apnea. And we've seen trends in the past in this kind of hodgepodge IH group as it was defined in, uh, previously, which is different from how we define it now, that it was a trend towards elevation. Um, so certainly there could be inflammation that underlies IH itself or the sleepiness in IH could in, be a precursor to other inflammatory diseases. Often people with severe rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or psoriatic arthritis will also report some sleepiness and fatigue with those conditions. So it's not um, unheard of that the sleepiness symptom could precede other um, symptoms of rheumatological disease or it can occur on its own. And that's what I'm trying to kind of clarify with running these cytokine profiles. Um, can we do a little bit better diagnostically at, dividing out these are the people that we think it's just going to be the sleepiness and these are the people that more fit a profile of maybe having another rheumatologic condition. Okay. Um, how can somebody get cytokine testing? Do you think that's something that could be, should be done? And how would one go about doing that? So I think right now we don't know quite enough yet for it to help from a diagnosis standpoint. Uh, one of the next steps I'm going to do with the data that I collected is try to backtrack and based on where each patient's profile, maybe they have a high level of IL-6 and a low level of TNF-alpha, and maybe there are 10 other patients that have that similar look when you look at their data. And I'm wondering if we group people by how their cytokines look as opposed to kind of the diagnoses we currently think of, could that better potentially be a better way to classify patients or at least a helpful way to aid in classifying patients? Mm -hmm. um, so I think in the future, this may play a role in the diagnoses. Right now, we don't know quite enough about um, the levels in each patient for it to be really a diagnostic marker to get tested. Okay. We have a question about um, just kind of simply, if you compare controls versus all of the IH, NT2, EDS folks as a group, 
what would you say are the most significant differences in cytokine levels between controls and sleepy folks? So the most significant differences, if you take kind of all of them together, it's mostly when you look at the symptom, um, the symptoms that people report. So the most striking differences was that people with um, sleepiness disorders had much lower levels of the GCSF or granulocyte colony stimulating factor. And they tend to report it a lot more trouble waking up in the morning. So I think one of the most significant findings is that that grogginess and trouble waking up in the morning is strongly correlated with that low level of GCSF, which you really only see in the sleepy patients and not in the controls. Um, so I think that that potentially could be one of the biggest uh, maybe targets for a therapy. Uh, there are um, GCSF augmenting, augmenting medications that already exist. So that could potentially be one of the most immediate avenues to try to treat that feeling of grogginess in the morning. Okay. Um, since this is dealing with inflammation and there's some other uh, research going on at Emory that deals with inflammation, is there some sort of linkage? Um, how does your study kind of fit into some other work that's going on? So there is a lot of, of work being done right now with cytokines at Emory. A lot of them actually are in the context of COVID-19. Um, there was a big push in the spring, actually, for a lot more researchers to try to integrate cytokines into their research and how they dealt with um, brain function. Um, the running of my cytokines actually predated the COVID-19 pandemic, but it was kind of serendipitous in that Emory is really trying to push now for a lot more work in IL-6 specifically, um, as well as TNF-alpha, since those cytokines are markedly elevated in COVID-19. And down-regulating those cytokines with medications have also been very effective in treating COVID-19. So a lot of the research does lie in that avenue, not specifically sleep at this point. But I think kind of as we transition to more of the late effects of this pandemic, there will be a, a second wave of interest in cytokines and how they're lingering around may um, cause more long-lasting symptoms such as sleepiness or narcolepsy or uh, IH type um, symptoms in folks. Okay. Um, we have a question about whether or not you had any findings related to cognitive impairments. So we did some of the um, some of the survey data that I looked at did look at cognitive impairment. Um, those are subgroups of um, questionnaires that we looked at. So the questionnaires in themselves did not show a correlation with any of the cytokine levels um, and the whole survey data, but I have yet to stratify out by specifically the cognitive components. So there could potentially be a cognitive um, part. And I think that that's actually um, supported by the fact that the sleep inertia was correlated with one of the cytokines since there's a cognitive portion to the sleep inertia or trouble waking up in the morning, trouble with your brain becoming clear. Okay. Um, is it known whether or not the relationship between any of the cytokines and IH are causative of IH or as a subsequent effect of IH? Any way to tell? I think it's a little bit of both, actually. Um, so there have been studies in healthy people will, where um, scientists will inject IL-6 in those people and then they become sleepy. So I think part of it is that um, patients with IH may be hitting their biggest peak of IL-6 during the day, thus it's making them more sleepy. But another theory about the cause of IH is that some people think that, at least in a subset of patients with IH, part of the issue is that instead of having a 24-hour circadian clock, you have a longer circadian clock. And as such, your IL-6 level may fluctuate around a different time course than the average person's IL-6 level does. So in that sense, it's both a cause of the sleepiness, but also could be the underlying factor as well is that because you're having a longer fluctuation, your circadian factors like the IL-6, that, that causes the overall sleepiness in IH. Okay. Um, is there any link between blood glucose level and cytokine levels? So that's a great question. Um, I didn't look at any of the specific blood glucose markers in my study. Um, there have been significant studies in the past um, since a lot of the cytokine levels are elevated in obstructive sleep apnea with glucose levels. Um, and there was some positive correlations between um, human growth factor, which kind of regulates your glucose and your insulin um, and patients with sleep apnea. So there may be a connection, but I didn't look at any specific markers that would tell us in this study. Okay, we're right at 1.30. 
I'm so glad that you came and we got to a lot of questions. So that's wonderful. Thank you very much. And I think we're gonna move on to our next presenter. I'd now like to introduce Dr. Todd Bishop, who is an investigator and health science specialist at the Department of Veterans Affairs, VA Center of Excellence for Suicide Prevention and an assistant professor of psychiatry at the University of Rochester Medical Center. In addition to earning a PhD in clinical psychology at the University of Syracuse in 2014, he has served in the Army National Guard and worked as a polysomnographic technician. This very unique combination of experiences has led him to become interested in researching the influence that sleep disturbances, such as insomnia and sleep-related breathing disorders, have on the development and course of psychopathology. Now he is bringing that expertise to the study of hypersomnias. Dr. Bishop is the second winner of a Hypersomnia Foundation Research Award grant. His program has been re-recorded, but he will join us live immediately afterwards to answer your questions. Hello, my name is Todd Bishop and I'm a researcher at the VA Center of Excellence for Suicide Prevention. Today, I'm looking forward to sharing with you uh, an initial peek at some of the exciting work around hypersomnia that we're doing at the VA in a partnership with the Hypersomnia Foundation. Uh, specifically, we're leveraging the expansive medical record of the VA to look in more in depth uh, at what we're hoping will be one of the largest samples of individuals with idiopathic hypersomnia uh, to date. The work I'm going to describe today is supported by the Hypersomnia Foundation. I'm also supported by a couple of VA grants. I'm a co-investigator on a merit award, which is the VA's equivalent of an R01. Uh, and that uh, grant is investigating brief cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia uh, on depression and suicidal ideation. And I was also recently awarded a grant from the Warren Alpert Foundation to study the provision of intensive case management uh, to vet veterans at risk for elevated, uh, elevated suicide risk following inpatient care. I have no conflicts of interest to report, and the views expressed in this talk are my own. So why should we worry about sleep? Well, for one, sleep problems are highly prevalent, uh, with at least 10% of the general population experiencing a sleep problem in a given year, and uh, four to 6% of those uh, uh, experiencing hypersomnia. Uh, sleep problems are also persistent in that they do not typically resolve on their own, or by treating comorbid uh, mental health problems. For example, nightmares are one of the final symptoms to remit following treatment for PTSD. Sleep problems can be pernicious, meaning that they can make existing disorders worse or even contribute to the development of things like depression or diabetes. But most important on this list, sleep problems are treatable. Effective interventions exist for several different sleep disorders, and those treatments are often portable or able to be uh, delivered across multiple settings. Much less is known, however, when it comes to idiopathic hypersomnia, thus the impetus for this work. Idiopathic hypersomnia, of course, is a disorder that's typically characterized by excessive daytime sleepiness, uh, despite uh, undisturbed sleep or the, uh, the absence of cataplexy or the absence of uh, other known causes of hypersomnolence, such as untreated sleep apnea. Idiopathic hypersomnia also appears to be a relatively rare disorder with a prevalence that's estimated to be uh, in the range of one out of or one to four out of every 100,000 people in the general population. What's more, IH uh, patients uh, uh, represent approximately 1% of patients who seek care at sleep centers. Uh, to give you some scale, there's about 200 stick figures in this image, meaning that this image would need to be at least 500 times uh, as large or have 500 times as many blue stick figures to give you an accurate representation of how often IH is actually seen in practice. This low base rate coupled with the challenge of making an accurate diagnosis uh, has contributed to limiting the amount of idiopathic hypersomnia research that's, that's really occurred in the field. So therefore the ideological underpinnings or the pathophysiology of IH remain largely uh, under, under research. So my own research to date has largely centered on the use of uh, big data sets to examine relationships among different aspects of sleep and suicide. And so when I met uh, some of your board members a couple of years ago at the annual sleep conference, I saw that my center's experience in working with big data might uh, nicely dovetail with the expertise and interests of the Hypersomnia Foundation. And so we, we saw the potential to force this unique collaboration. 
So you might be wondering, is, is since IH is rare, why VA, why big data? What does any of this have to do with veterans? Well, all valid questions. I'd say there's multiple ways for us to obtain knowledge on idiopathic hypersomnia. There's a very important patient level cataloging uh, the stories and the medical journeys of individuals who've been diagnosed with IH. And, and in addition uh, to those encounters being vital for creating positive clinical interactions and effective treatments, each of those case studies also gives researchers additional clues about the underpinnings of IH. And there's also exciting clinical trials uh, being done in the area of hypersomnia, such as the work that Dr. Dr. Jason Ong is doing with CBT for hypersomnia. Another path to knowledge is through big data. So as IH is a rare disorder, the leveraging of medical record data can provide us a glimpse uh, into the life of the thousands of individuals diagnosed with IH that we might otherwise never see uh, through our clinical practices or through a research trial. Very little is known about veterans who have been diagnosed with IH, but what is known is that veterans are frequently diagnosed with sleep disorders at greater rates than the general public. Um, and then perhaps most relevant on this slide is the VA is one of the largest healthcare systems in the United States, and it maintains a very detailed electronic medical record. So this combination of factors really gives us a unique environment in which to develop what will potentially be one of the largest samples of idiopathic hypersomnia diagnosed individuals in existence and allow us to examine not only the prevalence of IH, but physical and behavioral health correlates and ultimately treatment utilization patterns. So the present line of research is going to use VA medical record data to develop a validated process for the identification of cases of idiopathic hypersomnia within medical records and create a cohort of veterans diagnosed with IH in order to estimate the prevalence of IH among the veteran population and facilitate an examination of treatment utilization patterns and prescribing practices, and also to explore co-occurring physical and behavioral health conditions. So broken down a little bit more simply, we want to be able to say, here's a formula uh, for using medical record data to identify folks with IH with a high degree of confidence. We want to then use that process to create a data set consisting of 10 years worth of data covering everyone in VA uh, with a, a known IH diagnosis, and then use that to estimate the, how often IH occurs in IA, how often IH occurs within VA, and then to see what other uh, conditions folks with idiopathic hypersomnia also often have and how they might be different from uh, other folks who have, who have other hypersomnia disorders. And I sincerely hope that this project will also serve as scaffolding for future research uh, with the potential for collaboration with uh, other uh, research teams and subsequent analyses and even the creation of uh, prospective cohort studies. So instead of looking backwards, we can um, identify folks with idiopathic uh, hypersomnia and then follow them forward over time. Uh, so diving right in, we started by pulling all the data between 2009 and 2019. And this gave us a total of 3,674 veterans within VA who carried an ICD diagnosis of idiopathic hypersomnia in their medical record. So when we break this out by specific ICD codes, we see that roughly twice as many of these patients were diagnosed with idiopathic hypersomnia without long sleep as compared to those with the long sleep. And uh, 492 of these patients actually carried both diagnoses in the medical record at some point during the 10 years study time period. The average age of uh, folks in this cohort was 52 years and reflective of the veteran population encountered much of the data that currently exists, this IH sample is predominantly male. It's also exciting if you, if you look at the numbers that a large uh, sample of these individuals identify as black or Hispanic veterans uh, with idiopathic hypersomnia, which opens the possibility for additional research questions surrounding IH, race, and ethnicity. So medical records, as many of you know, can be notoriously messy. And uh, for the present analysis in this initial dive, we wanted to restrict the sample even further to exclude cases where there was even the suggestion that the hypersomnolence might be attributable to another disorder. So for the purposes uh, here of examining behavioral health and physical correlates, we excluded patients from this idiopathic hypersomnia data set at this phase if they had any of the conditions listed in the table uh, to the right 
during the six months following the initial appearance of idiopathic hypersomnia in the medical record. So we took the 3,600 people. If they had one of these conditions in the six months following their IH diagnosis, then they weren't included in this final data set um, of 1,058 people. This, of course, reduces some of the ecological or external validity, and then it, folks with IH often do present with co-occurring conditions. However, at this initial presentation of the data, we thought it best to be conservative in the estimates. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, in future, um, in future cohorts, we'll be able to include more, more covariates and allow, allow things to move around a little bit more. Thus, we're left with a final uh, idiopathic hypersomnia sample of 1,058 cases between fiscal years 2009 and 2019. So again, appreciating that this is an all-veteran sample, how do these two groups compare to one another? Well, the restricted IH sample is slightly older uh, with, with as compared to the rule-out uh, sample, the mean age of this uh, smaller final idiopathic site idiopathic hypersomnia sample is 57.7 years of age as compared to the mean age of 52 uh, for the larger group. And this final IH group has uh, more females, about 9% more females in it. Otherwise, the racial and ethnic breakdowns of the sample remain largely the same. So here are some of the initial count data uh, on the physical and behavioral health correlates of idiopathic hypersomnia. Uh, what is presented here are the number and percentage of IH cases where each of these given conditions were present in the electronic medical record in the six months preceding the initial appearance of the IH diagnosis. So notably in this restricted sample of over a thousand individuals with IH, we see that nearly a third of veterans diagnosed here were also diagnosed with depression and or post-traumatic stress disorder in the six months preceding their IH diagnosis. These values uh, outpace the prevalence of depression and PTSD in both the general and veteran population. So in addition to what we see here, I wanna note that we also searched the medical record for the presence of the following diagnoses and did not find any instance of them in the medical record of, of these folks with idiopathic hypersomnia in the six months prior to their diagnosis. And those would be hydrocephalus, multiple sclerosis, more vans, Ehlers-Danos syndrome, Prader-Willi, pituitary giantism, uh, familial dysentomia, and Parkinson's. So all of these values uh, should also be interpreted, of course, with the fact that this is a veteran population in mind. So some of these conditions, if identified prior to enlistment, would preclude subsequent military service. And, and other conditions uh, might be observed more commonly among veterans or among men, which made up two thirds of this sample. So to provide additional context, we wanted to compare veterans diagnosed with IH to veterans diagnosed with other hypersomnia disorders. We therefore created an additional cohort of all veterans diagnosed with one of the following, hypersomnia conditions during that same 10 year timeframe from 2009 to 2019. This yielded a sample of 110,530 veterans who were diagnosed with either primary hypersomnia, unspecified hypersomnia, Klein-Levin syndrome, or hypersomnia not due to a substance or physiological condition. So what does that group look like when compared to the idiopathic uh, hypersomnia group? Well, you can see uh, on the right, we have the idiopathic hypersomnia group with 1,058 veterans. And in blue, we have the newly created cohort with 110,000 individuals and on balance, while the samples both remain predominantly male, we see that females made up 30% of veterans diagnosed with idiopathic hypersomnia as compared to only 12% of those diagnosed with one of these other hypersomnia disorders. So how did they compare in terms of their physical and behavioral health correlates? Well, on the left in blue, we see the group of 110,000 veterans with hypersomnia disorders besides IH. And on the right, again, in orange, we see the final IH sample of a little over a thousand people. Uh, these values again represent ICD codes present in the medical record during the a me medical visit in the six months prior to the IH diagnosis. And right out the gate, we see that the other hypersomnia group uh, has a much greater uh, proportion of individuals with diabetes and obesity. Uh, and recall on the prior slide that the same group had a much uh, 
higher proportion of men than did the IH cohort. I also want to point, draw your attention to the following relationships highlighted in green. Each of these represent a statistically significant relationship or difference between groups. And we can see that individuals diagnosed with IH were significantly more likely to carry a diagnosis of depression, PTSD, uh, and chronic or chronic fatigue syndrome in the six months prior to being diagnosed with IH. Also interesting, we see that folks diagnosed with IH were less likely than other hypersomnia cohort to be diagnosed with an anxiety disorder during that same time frame. So these data also allow us to examine some uh, potential racial and ethnic disparities when it comes to veterans diagnosed with hypersomnia disorders. In June, the Hypersomnia Foundation and I were able to examine some of the CORDS data, as well as take an early look at some of this VA data in order to respond to a request for information from the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. The majority of the IH uh, community uh, uh, that's interacting with the Hypersomnia Foundation uh, are, tend to be uh, identified as white and female. Specifically, 92.9% uh, of the CORDS databases of June 2020 identified as white and 84.5% as female. In contrast, uh, the U.S. population is, is roughly 60% uh, identifies as white and 51% as female. So if we assume that hypersomnias do not differentially impact individuals based on race or ethnicity, then the racial and ethnic profile of our patient community should largely be a reflection of the U.S. population. But it may be, however, that a lack of equal access to health care uh, is, is somehow presented preventing people who identify as racial or ethnic minorities uh, from ever obtaining a hypersomnia diagnosis. So the Veterans Health Administration serves as a unique patient population that while still predominantly white and male, also includes large numbers of racial and ethnic minorities. Uh, and in addition, the system affords high quality health care across uh, racial and ethnic uh, backgrounds. So we pulled all data between uh, years 2016 and 2019 and found roughly 72,000 uh, veterans diagnosed with a hypersomnia disorder. When we look at the demographic breakdown of those groups, we found that they identified more frequently as female uh, and uh, or as a racial and ethnic minority than population data tells us we should expect. So for example, while females make up approximately 9.6% of veterans that use VA services, they comprise 13.1% of hypersomnia diagnoses during that same time period. Likewise, while veterans identifying as Black or African American make up a, around 11.8% of veterans, uh, they represent 21.4% of hypersomnia diagnoses. So the disparity is even greater when we break hypersomnia out by specific disorders. So uh, idiopathic hypersomnia, for example, uh, female veterans comprise 31.2% of the cases of IH, which is more than threefold what we would expect uh, if the rates of the disorder were uh, mirrored uh, in the demographics of the veteran population. So this demographic breakdown is particularly in the, important in the context of current uh, trends within VA. Um, as a starting point, we know that veterans frequently struggle with sleep disorders, and it's one of the most common complaints presented in primary care. But what our data also shows is that there's a significant 50% increase in the number of veterans diagnosed with a hypersomnia uh, that's that's been seen between fiscal years 2000 and 2010. And should that current utilization and diagnostic trend continue, the VA could expect to see a disproportionate increase in sleep disorders, including hypersomnia disorders in the years to come. So for example, female veterans uh, who engaged in VA services increased by 51.8% from 2008 to 2017. Well, during that same time frame the number of male veterans engaging only increased 9.8%. Uh, in, in similarly, the number of veterans identifying as racial or ethnic minorities, uh, particularly identifying uh, those identifying as Black or African American or Hispanic, is projected to substantially increase between 2014 and 2043. So generally what we can pull from this is that uh, we don't know if hypersomnia disorders are equally likely to occur among individuals with different racial or ethnic backgrounds. Um, but we suspect a significant disparity in the diagnosis and treatment of these conditions, leaning towards uh, a problem of underdiagnosis being more pronounced among racial and ethnic minority groups outside of VA. 
Uh, so what are the next steps from here? Well, we find ourselves with a lot of data in hand and more to be extracted. In addition to the uh, broad overview today, we'll ultimately uh, pull treatment utilization and pharmacy data as well so that we can better examine how uh, patients with IH are interacting and moving through the healthcare system. And in order to improve our ability to identify true cases and facilitate future electronic medical record research by other uh, research teams, um, we will be using the data presented here as a starting point to conduct a series of chart reviews to identify cases that can serve as ground truths. So folks that were really confident um, in their IH diagnosis. And then we'll test various versions of a, an algorithm against it to find the combination of criteria, medical visits, um, pharmacy data that produces the best balance of specificity and sensitivity and accurately identifying idiopathic hypersomnia cases in the medical record. That comes with some challenges, the first of which can be seen right here in this table. Uh, only 13% of folks diagnosed with idiopathic hypersomnia within VA had a documented polysomnogram in the six months prior to the first appearance of this diagnosis. Um, only 7.5% had a documented MSLT. So there's potentially several reasons for that, um, including that some of this testing might be occurring outside of VA. Um, Nonetheless, uh, even highlighting this lack of documentation uh, of sleep testing within VHA can serve as a starting point for conversations with providers uh, regarding the proper identification and uh, diagnosis of IH. So ultimately, it's our hope that a refined algorithm and better understanding of diagnostic utilization and treatment patterns uh, within VA will allow us to, to look at these physical and behavioral correlates with more accuracy and to develop new treatment targets and enhance our understanding of idiopathic hypersomnia. Well, thank you very much for uh, calling into the conference today and listening uh, to this talk. I very much look forward to any questions you might have and working with some of you in the future on uh, uh, leveraging this, this large data set that we now have in our possession. Thank you, Dr. Bishop for that amazing presentation. Uh, a lot of data, sorting through a lot of data, trying to find the nuggets of information that we need. And we do have a couple of folks that have submitted some questions. So the first question is from a veteran who um, is asking, do you think it's possible that physiologic changes are made in the brain due to the sleep-wake hours and prolonged sleep deprivation that sometimes you might experience in the military? In other words, does your military sleep schedule potentially contribute to uh, getting IH? So any thoughts yeah. on that? Um, so I'll, I will punt the physiological piece of that question to, to my MD colleagues. Uh, I don't wanna get ahead of my skis on that, but. I will say that this is a very common pattern we see with veterans. A, a lot of folks uh, come into VA having um, had um, uh, an odd sleep schedule or shift work sleep schedule during their service, um, you know, experiencing hot periods of high stress or danger during times when you're supposed to be sleeping and, 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 um, and you know, even uh, exposure to um, things like more nicotine use or more caffeine use uh, in, in theater. Um, so those things can certainly mess with your sleep schedule and be a behavioral kind of uh, factor, behavioral pattern that can lead to the development or worsening of your sleep. But in terms of the uh, it being a physiological precursor to IH developing, um, I would, yeah, I'd punt that one to, to my MD colleagues. Yeah, that's a, that's a different kind of doctor that would answer that question, right? <laughs> okay, super. Moving on, um, we have a question um, it, about your observation of depression and PTSD comorbidity. So are you looking at this as a cause for IH or as IH is putting the individual at higher risk of developing depression and PTSD? Mm -hmm. So uh, I think those are both valid approaches and both valid uh, research targets. Uh, the data that was presented here was just in the six months leading up to that first IH diagnosis. Um, and it was more to kind of give a, a snapshot of here's what folks have going on at uh, comparable time, comparable time, almost the same time. Um, when we uh, continue to expand this data set and, and, and pull more data, we will uh, we'll have the six months 
following as well, we'll probably push it out to a year post IH diagnosis to see what um, uh, disorders or diagnose, new diagnoses occur in the medical record uh, to see if folks with IH are more likely um, to have to have that I'm not presented in the slides, uh, but I have the, the data right here. I can say that in the six months um, following the initial idiopathic hypersomnia diagnosis, uh, um, 29% of the sample did have a uh, depression diagnosis in the medical record. But the way that it was entered in this particular data pool, it might not have been the first occurrence of it, right? So, so that diagnosis may have moved with them from two years ago to, to, to current. Um, and so long story short, both veiled questions, both are of great interest and they can tell us different things. Uh, and uh, I yeah, plan on pulling more and more data and I really hope that uh, I get to collaborate with some additional folks from the Hypersomnia Foundation to try to unpack some of that. Okay. Um, we only have time for one more question because we need to take a break. Um, so I'll ask this one, given a possible socioeconomic difference in those who enlist in the military, do you think this might explain the difference in the racial and ethnic minority diagnosis? Because this group in the military has more access to medical care than might otherwise um, happen, and therefore they get a diagnosis that they may not have had if they stayed as a civilian. Yeah, um, absolutely. I, I think that um, when we're looking at this uh, racial and race and ethnicity data, one thing to, to really keep in mind is, is that uh, any differences in here might be driven by socioeconomic um, factors, uh, rurality, um, access to care. Um, those things uh, definitely could be driving the difference. And in a system like VA, um, they, they pride themselves on, you know, like trying to, to minimize uh, any, any of that, uh, any of those disparities that might occur um, and, and and providing uh, great health care for, for uh, folks across socioeconomic or racial and, and uh, ethnic diversity spectrums. Um, so I think moving forward, you know, like with, with this particular analysis, it'll be important not to just include um, racial and uh, indicators of where veterans have identified as a racial or ethnic minority, but also things that help, help us look at socioeconomic status. Uh, we, can, we can tell um, how rural their zip code is, things like that, um, that can really deepen our, our look at, at that data because, you know, it's it's easy to, to knee jerk and jump towards like, oh, there's a genetic difference there or something. But no, a lot, a lot of a lot of this can likely be explained by some of those other factors. That other factors, too. Well, thank you so much um, for doing this research. And we know there's more to come and hopefully there'll be another opportunity to hear about your results in the future. Right now, we are going to take a five minute break. So there'll be some slides going across your screen and we'll see you at 2.03.
Welcome back. I mentioned earlier that we have a few announcements. Um, first, I want to let you know about a volunteer opportunity at the Hypersomnia Foundation. As some of you know, we have a great group of volunteers we call the PAC, which stands for Patient Advisory and Advocacy Council, P-A-A-C. These are people who have idiopathic hypersomnia or a related disorder, or they're supporters of someone with one of these rare sleep disorders. In brief, they help our board stay in touch with the sleep community. We reach out to them to test out ideas and they take on various projects for the board. The group meets once a month by phone and communicates by email in between. I understand they currently have one space open on the pack. So if you think you may be able to make that commitment, please email us to learn more. Write to us at this address, info at hypersomniafoundation.org. It's a mouthful. Info at hypersomniafoundation.org and just put either PAC or volunteering in the subject line. I would got to be on their call in September, by the way, and they just, they really are just a, a terrific group. So if you're interested again, give us a shout. Also, many of you may have seen this news already on social media. We recently welcomed two new board members and I'd like to take a moment to introduce you to them. Angel Burgess is already known to, well known to many of you. She is a top disability attorney in Atlanta, Georgia, and she has been very generous in giving her time to the Hypersomnia Foundation over um, some years. And we are just delighted that she has joined the board of directors of the Hypersomnia Foundation. Welcome, Angel. Thank you, Diane. It is an honor to join such a dynamic organization, and I'm looking forward to pitching in and, and working with all of you. Thank you. It's just, it's great to have you. And, you know, you and I were talking earlier this, this week, were you able to figure out how many presentations you've given for the Hypersomnia Foundation, or was it just too many to count? It was too many to count. Okay. <laughs> All right, well, I'm, I'm not surprised to hear that answer. And some of you may have seen Angel present about a week ago at the mini conference of the Narcolepsy Network. And if you'd like to see some of her past uh, presentations for the Hypersomnia Foundation, you can take a look at the video page on our website. And now I'd like to introduce you to uh, another, our other new board member, David Burley. David Burley, Burley has been, David has been so helpful in organizing today's event. He is Chief Technology Officer at UPIC Solutions, a nonprofit profit service organization for United Way. He's also a longtime supporter of the Hypersomnia Foundation, and he himself has had idi idiopathic hypersomnia for a number of years. Welcome, David. Thank you, Diane. Uh, I'm excited to join the Hypersomnia Foundation board and look forward to working with the team to improve the lives of the hypersomnia community. Um, my involvement began by joining the, the court's patient registry, which is crucial for those of us with idiopathic hypersomnia to help others. Um, I would encourage everyone diagnosed with IH, KLS, and narcolepsy to go to hypersomniafoundation.org slash registry to enroll. Uh, and I would also encourage everyone to fill out the post-event survey at the end of today's event, allowing us to improve our program content into the future. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Didn't take long for you to, to get on board. Thank you so much. Please stay with us to the end of the program as we make a couple of announcements about some upcoming changes to the Hypersomnia Foundation. Rebecca? So let's get to our next guest, Christina Brundage, who is a very active member of our Hypersomnia community. Since being diagnosed with IHN in 2018, she has participated in three different drug, study, uh, drug trials and she's added her information to the CORES registry. She joined the Young Adult Representatives of Rare Disease Legislative Advocates and is constantly looking for ways to help the rare disease community. So when she's not sleeping, she enjoys spending time with her husband and two dogs, reading and watching Netflix in bed. So let's hear from Christina. <laughs> um, hi, like Rebecca said, uh, I am Christina Brundage. I'm very honored to be here today, and I'm so happy that everyone is here to learn more about hypersomnia research. Um, for as long as I can remember, I've always been tired. I never really thought much of it. I thought I was just excellent at sleeping. 
Growing up, I would fall asleep on the bus every morning and afternoon. I would fall asleep in class. I would take naps when I got home. And during the summers, I would usually wake up at around five o'clock p.m. when my mom got home from work. In college, I would often sleep through classes and I actually made my class schedules around when I could take naps. Um, I've fallen asleep in restaurants, on the concrete outside of airports, standing up, talking to people, during ballets, and several times on the back of motorcycles. I have had about 30 alarms set on my phone and three alarms throughout my room, and most days I would still sleep through them. Still, I thought it was normal. I didn't see, or I, I really didn't see, want to see that I had a problem. It wasn't until a visit in 2018 with a new dentist that I started to think differently. Uh, when I got there, he started asking me a lot of questions about my sleep and how I felt throughout the day. I told him that I never felt rested and I was always tired. When he looked at my mouth, he noticed that I had larger tonsils from chronic strep infections as a child. He mentioned that I could possibly have sleep apnea and he told me to look into getting my tonsils removed. This kind of made me hesitate. Um, if you may know, tonsillectomies as an adult can be really, really hard to get through. Uh, so instead, I went to see a sleep doctor to inquire about a sleep study. When he ordered the study, he told me that he was going to add in an MSLT to check for narcolepsy. Later on, when I was telling my family, I actually laughed at the idea. I thought there was no way that I had narcolepsy or anything close to it. Honestly, the only thing I knew about narcolepsy was Rowan Atkinson's character back in Rat Race. It's a really old movie. <laughs> When the doctor came in to tell me my results, I was pretty shocked and confused. I had never heard of idiopathic hypersomnia and the doctor didn't give me much information either. He just gave me armadafinil and told me to come back in six months. When I left the office, I started doing my own research. Um, I found the Hypersomnia Foundation and through them the Cords Registry. I immediately added my information in because I wanted all information about any future stu study trials. A month or so later, I had actually started trying to contact my sleep doctor because I wasn't feeling any different from the medication they gave me. Unfortunately, they did never return my calls or emails. And because of the lack of communication, I decided it was time to find a new provider. Previously, in, with my hypersomnia research, I found on the Hypersomnia Foundation page, um, they have a healthcare provider directory. So I went back there and I found my current doctor, Dr. Bogan with Bogan Sleep Consultants. At basically that same time, I got an email from the Cords Registry telling me about a clinical trial that was looking for participants. I sent in my information and surprisingly enough, I got an email from the research coordinator at Bogan Sleep Consultants, the same place I was about to have a new patient appointment at. The day I went in for my appointment, Dr. Bogan was night and day from my previous doctor. He must have spent over an hour talking to me and explaining to me everything there is to know about hypersomnia. And he made sure that at the end of the appointment, I had absolutely no questions about anything. After we were done, the research coordinator came in to give me the information about the clinical trial. I was really nervous. Um, I had never done anything like this before. My dad was even more nervous. And he told me that he didn't think that I should do the trial because he said there really wasn't any guarantee that it was safe. But I'll talk more about that later. I thought long and hard on it. And ultimately, I decided that this was something I needed to do. I'm not capable of doing research to help myself out or my fellow IHers, um, but I am definitely capable of participating in research because without participants, as you've seen, the research, it can't be done. Ultimately, I have participated in three different trials. Um, everybody's experience will be different. What I felt may not be the same for you, um, but I can tell you about how it was for me. All of the studies I took in, uh, pardon, were double blind placebo controlled crossover studies, which I've been told is the golden standard. Um, this means that there are two stages for them. 
I was guaranteed to get the real medication during one of the stages, and then I was going to get a placebo for the other part. I'm almost positive during all three trials that I knew which one was the placebo versus the real medication, because there were times that I was definitely less exhausted um, or times that I was very definitely awake. Um, like I wasn't tired at all. The studies were all different in some ways. Uh, the worst part of them, though, were the sleep diaries. Um, for one of the trials, I had to put information into a cell phone uh, that they gave me, and I had to put it in twice a day about how I slept, when I slept, if I took naps, and how I felt throughout the whole day. This was during and before, before and during the trial. Mostly, I'm really bad at remembering to do things. Um, so it was also on a timer. So if I waited too late or if I slept in too late, I wouldn't be able to put my information in. And for this particular study, if that happened too often, there was a chance that they would kick me out. So the research coordinator actually stayed on top of me to make sure I was getting my information in most days. For some of the studies, I had to go into the clinic several times for overnight studies and maintenance of wakefulness tests, which is where you sit in a dark room and try to stay awake. It's pretty hard for hypersomnia. <laughs> in the first study, I fell asleep quickly during the uh, MWTs during both phases. Um, other than still being sleepy, but not as exhausted, I had no other effects from the medication. Um, it was a really, really good experience, and I was excited to be able to start another clinical trial. But uh, for this particular, for the next one, I did have to wait three months in between. In the spring of 2019, the time came for me to be able to start the next clinical trial. I was really ready because I was excited to see how I re would react to this one versus the previous one. Because this st study was in its later stage, I didn't have to go in and do overnight testing. I just had to go to the clinic several times to tell them how I was feeling, get a, clinic, uh, get a physical done, and to increase my dosage. I did have some trouble with this trial. Uh, mostly it was from the side effects. Even though I did have side effects though, I was very awake um, and I felt pretty good. I think if I wouldn't have had the side effects that I did, um, it definitely would have been the medication for me. In the end though, with this study, I terminated early. Um, I ended up having to go on a two week overseas trip. So that's the main reason why I did. Um, terminating early made me really, really nervous. Um, I was afraid that even though sleep clinics aren't supposed to, um, that they wouldn't invite me back for new studies. Uh, of course, as I found out, there shouldn't be any anxiety with terminating early. My research coordinator was amazing. She reassured me several times that they would not hold it against me and they would honor any choice that I made. In early 2020, she sent me an email about another clinical study. This would be my third. Because of the pandemic, I wasn't able to start this third clinical study until August of 2020. The screening period was fairly easy. It had the best sleep diary of all because it was just a piece of paper that I had to fill out for a week. Um, it, I was more nervous for this one because it was in an early study phase um, and they had a lot of different qualifiers. Uh, the biggest qualifier I had to get through was my BMI. Unfortunately, during the quarantine, I gained a significant amount of weight, um, so I was slightly above the BMI that they wanted me to be at. Uh, I did end up changing my eating habits, and I slid right underneath uh, where they wanted me to be. I was also a little concerned because they required you to be in the sleep lab for a long time, but luckily, I spoke with my job, and they allowed me to work from home, so I was able to work during the study. The first stage of this study, I knew that either A, I had received the placebo or B, the medication just didn't work for me. Uh, while I was in the lab, I was counting down the times for the MWTs because I was so tired, I just wanted to sleep. During the second stage of the study, I felt awake almost immediately after taking the medication. I was slightly nauseous at first, but that day I had also eaten hospital breakfast food and I'm willing to bet that it was because of that. The first uh, MW came, MWT came and I was not tired at all. I just stared at the wall the whole time, not moving because you're not allowed to. Um, and so during that second stage, I was actually dreading the MWT because I knew I'd be sitting bored. I really wasn't tired the entire time. I don't think I even yawned once during that second stage. 
my mind felt awake and my body felt awake. It was truly amazing and something I had never felt before. All in all, I am so incredibly happy that I've had these opportunities because now I really know what works for me and what to look for in the market uh, when these medications ultimately get approved. Earlier, uh, when I had said my dad was nervous about my safety, uh, I found throughout each study, I never felt unsafe or taken advantage of. The doctors and research coordinator were there for me every step of the way and to answer any questions I may have had. And I had a lot and I emailed them a lot. Um, as far as safety, I feel like these trials are incredibly safe, especially the later phases, because you know people have already been through them. Of course, you have to do what you are you feel comfortable with, uh, but I think studies are a very worthwhile thing to do, not only because you can be benefiting yourself, but you're also helping others with your same condition. In addition, many of the studies will actually compensate you for your time and sometimes your travel, since the sponsors recognize that you are giving up some of your life and sometimes your finances, to, if you have to take time off of work, to participate in these trials. Uh, while my main goal is to further hypersomnia research and find better hypersomnia treatments, I still appreciate that the sponsors recognize that my time and my energy are important and valuable. I will continue to participate in trials until they tell me to stop. I am the perfect age range and I'm not planning on having children anytime soon, so I don't have to worry about pregnancy. Yeah. Um, but if you are interested in participating in a study, I highly, highly recommend you go to a sponsor clinic and at least get information about it. All right, Christina, thank you so much for all of your stories yeah. and all of your work to help find new cures for idiopathic hypersomnia and related sleep disorders. We do have a couple of people that have submitted some questions. Um, so one is, have any of the trials where the medication you felt might be helpful to you offered you options for continuing the medication after the trial? So um, the second one I did, they did offer it, um, but I had terminated, er terminated early, so I didn't get that chance to take it afterwards. Um, the other two were too early in their um, stages for them to be able to offer it. Okay, all right, super. Um, and then another question would be, um, it's a little bit more about your experience um, having idiopathic hypersomnia because it's not really a household name like narcolepsy is. So the question is, do you have some advice for how to deal with educating those around you like close friends and family or maybe even employers? Um, so to, to help them understand what idiopathic hypersomnia is and how it affects you? Yeah, um, so luckily for me, I don't think I've ever ran into an issue with um, educating. I think it's because I'm bossy. So uh, when I tell people something, they don't, I think they're afraid to question anything that I say. Um, but for me, I, I kind of start out, um, I let people know, hey, I have hyper, idiopathic hypersomnia and it's a cousin of narcolepsy. Um, so they kind of get in their mind, okay, well, I, I might not know what narcolepsy is. So this is something that's close to it. Um, and then I kind of go into explaining, um, I say, no matter how, how much sleep I get, I'm always tired. So I can sleep for an entire day and then I'll still feel like I haven't slept. Um, and I think that kind of helps me, like helps other people I know under, kind of understand um, where I'm coming from. Um, so those are kind of my two things that I say, uh, okay. I mean, and I think you really have to um, figure out what's best, like with who you're talking to. Um, and the, I do know the Hypersomnia Foundation has some pretty good um, information as well for talking with people. So. Yeah, so there's a couple of questions um, asking about uh, kind of who is allowed to participate in clinical trials and, and what are some criteria that kind of you, you can't often participate in trials. I don't know how familiar you became with the requirements for these trials. Like if you're of older age, can you participate? And if you know it, let me know. And if you don't really know it, um, we, we probably have some other ways of figuring out this, these, yeah. the answers to these questions. Um, well, I do know it, it depends. Um, different trials have different criteria. Um, so sometimes they are from like 
I, they're usually 18 and up, um, and then uh, there is a cutoff for age, and it just depends on the trial. Um, I have seen a lot of trials won't let you, if you have some other type of um, sleep, say you have restless leg syndrome, they won't let you participate. Um, so they really want you to just have a hypersomnia diagnosis. Um, and as a woman, as a young woman, um, birth control is a big thing as well. Um, so I have the arm implant for my birth control, but um, if you have different things or if you're not on it, sometimes they also won't let you participate because they want to make sure that you're not gonna get pregnant during the trial. Super. Well, on our clinical trials webpage on the hypersomniafoundation.org website, uh, there is a page that lists open trials Lots of times there's a link to a web page describing the trial, and sometimes there will be information about who is eligible. And there's always somebody to contact and ask the questions about whether or not you think you would be able to participate. So I encourage people to use that website and uh, research what's out there. Thank you, Christina, so much for sharing your personal story and for your continued work to um, do clinical trials so that the rest of us can hopefully get some medications uh, eventually approved through the FDA. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having yes. me. Yes. <laughs> All right. So now we're going to have our very last presenter. Dr. Marissa Whalen is an associate director for Jazz Pharmaceuticals. She received her Doctor of Pharmacy degree from the University of the Sciences, Philadelphia College of Pharmacy, and is a licensed pharmacist in the state of New Jersey. Some last final announcements about how the research is continuing in our hypersomnia community. I'll turn you over to Diane. Thank you, Rebecca. And thank you, Dr. Whalen. And thanks to Christina Brundage. Before we sign off, I just want to share that in January, we'll be welcoming new chairs of our scientific and medical advisory boards. Our current chairs, Dr. David Rye and Dr. Lynn Marie Trotty, have generously served for nearly six years. Uh, in fact, it will be six years when they come to their term limits in January. And we are extremely grateful for, for all of their help as HF developed and has, has grown. And um, in fact, at our board meeting last month, Dr. Trotty joined us to receive our annual impact award for 2020, which we had planned to give her in person at our conference uh, in June, which of course we had to cancel. And Dr. Rye was the first recipient of that award. Happily, Drs. Trotty and Rye will remain on our advisory boards when they reach, as I mentioned, their chair term limits this January. I'm pleased to announce that Dr. David Plant has agreed to become chair of our medical advisory board. Dr. Plant is with the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health, where he is also program director for the university's Sleep Medicine Fellowship. Dr. Thondang Vu of Concordia University in Montreal will move over to our scientific advisory board to take on that chair role. Dr. Deng Vu currently holds the university research chair in sleep, Neuroimaging and Cognitive Health at Concordia, and fills numerous other roles at Concordia, McGill, and elsewhere as a clinician, researcher, and associate professor. And you can see both Dr. Plant's and Dr. Dang Vu's complete and extensive bios on our website. So HF continues to change and expand, and I'd like to thank all of our guests, our sponsors, my co-host, Rebecca King, and uh, board members, David Burley and Angel Burgess. Many thanks to all of you who donate to HF and to research. The funding for Dr. Mayness and Dr. Bishop came from people like you because you know that research funding is critical for a rare disorder like IH. If you'd like to help, please go to our donor page on our website, hypersomniafoundation.org. Before I let you go, I just want to remind you, as David mentioned, that a very short survey on today's program will pop up on your screen in a moment, and we would really appreciate it if you would take a few minutes to fill that out. On behalf of everyone at the Hypersomnia Foundation, our thanks to you for joining us today. Stay safe and enjoy the rest of your day.